following, following close on the heels of that there, uh, <laughs> it, nice, in a nice segue, um, obviously we've just been considering the role that objects played for Sir Walter Scott. And um, it's important, I think, to remember the role that different organisations have played for Scott over, over his lifetime and beyond. And certainly a tremendously important organisation for Scott during his lifetime was the Society of Ant Antiquaries of Scotland. And it was actually just about 11 years before Scott's birth that the Society of Antiquaries was actually formed. Scott became a member at the relatively young age of 25 as well. And so he would have certainly been familiar with the material collections, a really concerted effort by the antiquaries to bring together, not exclusively, but predominantly, fragments and objects of Scotland's past and to bring them together in a physical collection that people could access and view and visit. And Scott certainly took advantage of that and was familiar with lots of the different objects uh, from that museum. Now this is especially relevant because that's a, a collection that remains to this day. It was one of many collections which formed the basis of what today is the collection of the National Museum of Scotland. Um, and many of the objects that Scotland was able to see during his lifetime and take inspiration from and many resulting poems and novels that came from that, we can still access and visit and view those objects even to this day, taking our own inspiration, even if that puts a little bit of pressure on, on us all to um, become international best-selling novelists. Um, but I think that the, 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 the importance that is to be placed on material collections for Scott's fiction, for Scott's person and his own inspiration can't be understated. And as I say, the fact that Scott not only accessed that collection we can view today, but that he himself has become part of that collection um, and the items belonging to Scott from his childhood, from his youth, and even objects inspired by his fiction now form part of the National Museum of Scotland is something truly inspiring in itself. Um, so I'd like to raise a second toast, and this time I'd like to raise a toast to the many people involved in curating, conserving, and preparing the wonderful exhibits in places like the National Museum of Scotland, meaning that people can come and see those collections and visit and take inspiration from them themselves. So if, I'd like to invite you to join me to raise a toast for National Museums of Scotland. <laughs> Scotland um, to give our reply to my toast. Thank you, Anna. I'm getting rather emotional. Um, but before I get too emotional, I'd just like to say on behalf of National Museum of Scotland, I'd like to thank you and everyone here in the Edinburgh Scots Club for inviting me, for recognising what National Museum of Scotland do in terms of preserving Scotland's past, in which, of course, Sir Walter Scott is so phenomenally important. Um, and in response, I'd like to raise a glass of abstemious water <laughs> to your wonderful club. Thank you for having us this evening. I think first, and I'm not going to be too long, um, I'd like to pick up on Lucy's point about the connection between Scott, the antiquary and the collector, and Scott, the writer, and the importance of objects in his historical fiction. You might expect me, as a museum curator, you know, that's one of my key interests in him. And I think that's what led me into him to start with. And as Lucy's outlined, the museum has ancient links with Scott as an early member of the Society of Antiquaries. Um, he was um, vice president of the Antiquaries from 
1827 to 1829, which I can't quite imagine because he was scribbling furiously, of course, at that point um, to pay off his debts. Um, given that 30 years later the Society's collections were transformed to the new National Museum of Antiquities, the precursor of the National Museums of Scotland, as Lucy has said, Scott will have been familiar with the original, the earlier donations of our current collections. And I have to say, working there day by day, we are incredibly aware of this legacy. As an antiquary, Scott worked in the national interest, preserving the tangible aspects of Scotland's past before it disappeared in the face of urbanisation and the Industrial Revolution. As a passionate collector, he amassed displays of many antiquities, as we all know, in his I Love This, Romance of the House at Abbotsford. He then combined these interests in the nation's past and its antiquities in his writing. I think notably, he was a very pictorial writer. He used historical objects and settings that we recognize, you can imagine, you know, crumbling Melrose Abbey, for instance. Um, he used these settings and objects to create vivid images that linger now in our minds, and around which he wove his dramatic narratives and historical events. In his 26 historical novels, um, he, these were made compelling through that passion for history, especially that of Scotland, its colourful stories, um, and its intriguing artefacts. He was very aware of the power of objects in telling a story. Um, and for me, this is one of the key things, because to me, objects carry emotion. And Scott was an emotional man in his writing, that human empathy that comes through time and time again. And objects, like the ring, and lots of other things we could talk about carry that emotion with them and they carry it through the years, through the decades, through the generations down to us now. He described, and this was one of the, I just love this word, he describes these objects and the power of them in his reliquary. Um, he calls them gabions, I'm sure you all know this, but I didn't know this until I began to look into it. Gabions, curiosities of small intrinsic value, that is, financial or even aesthetic, whether rare books, antiquities, objects of the fine or the useful arts, but which became meaningful in the historical tales and figures that are attached to them. Scott often parodied himself, as you know, and his fellow antiquaries in his novels. And Lucy's already uh, mentioned the antiquaries, but I'm going to <laughs> mention it again. He wrote that his main, I love this, his main character existed amid a chaos of maps, engravings, scraps of parchment, pieces of old armor, salts, dirks, helmets, and highland targes. And that really recalls that wonderful um, image of Scott in his study, surrounded by all these objects, exactly as he describes the antiquary, um, with um, the hourglass that we now have actually in National Museum Scotland on the mantelpiece, and um, a statue of the bard, the original historical writer, fiction writer. Um, in honour of his uh, 250th anniversary of his birth in 2021, we wanted to bring this combination of Scott the Collector, antiquary and writer of historical fiction together in a small museum to honour him. And we called it, and you said the word already, uh, inspiring Walter Scott. And that was a nod to the objects that had inspired him, but also the way he inspires our own historical imagination all these many years later. Um, it's still on, the exhibition, because of COVID, um, we've been allowed to extend. So we've, um, it's been on for two years and will close on the 18th of June, but you will be very welcome to visit it. And if you want to email me about anything in, in relation to it, I'm very happy to answer. 
So in this little exhibition, it's just a little one, um, we took five major themes from his work and narrated them through the objects that we have that are relevant, using quotations from his work, illustrations, and also a voice actor to read some of the extracts in which the objects that you see are narrated in his novels. Our themes um, were the borders and ballad, um, sorry, the borders and ballads, knights and crusades, religion and reformation, covenanters and Jacobites, crime and punishment. And I think all of these came together to show how Scott used his gabions um, to dramatise his stories. I'm just going to use one example of what we did, one case, um, and that is this last theme of crime and punishment. Um, and I didn't quite know that Lucy was going to talk about the heart of my Lothian, but I will continue. <laughs> Um, as an example, I want to use this particular one as an example because it has objects closely linked to Scott's own collection and writing, which feature also in the Heart of Midlothian of 1818 and Rob Roy of 1817. In the first, the Heart of Midlothian, Scott preserved the memory, as we've heard, of Edinburgh's notorious prison, the old toll booth, in his description of its punitive restraints and harsh conditions. I'm not going to read you the extract from that because actually that human emotion really, really, his understanding of the human experience really comes through in just how horrible these things were. But on display, we do use it in the display and we have the um, actor speaking it. Um, on display, we have a giant iron padlock. I mean, it is literally this big and a set of manacles taken from the toll booth prior to its demolition in 1817. And as we've heard from Lucy, Scott himself saved parts of the toll booth building, building them into the fabric of Abbotsford. But in the second, Rob Roy, Scott describes the fictional MacGregor's ingenious foreign, fiendishly difficult to get into, guarded by a four-barreled pistol sporran clasp which Max matches, exactly, an 18th century sporran class donated to the Society of Antiquaries in 1783. It's one of the earliest things that were donated to our, to our collections. As a member of the antiquary, Scott is almost certain to have seen it. I mean, I'm not even going to say almost. He saw it. Full stop. In 1817, Scott himself acquired a sporran allegedly owned by Rob Roy McGregor, of which he observed, once something was in it, I defy anyone to find the means of getting it out again. In Rob Roy, the antiquary sporran clasp appeared as, in a large leathern pouch, such as Highlanders of rank wear before them, when in full dress, made of the skin of the sea otter, richly garnished with silver ornaments and studs. I advise no man to attempt opening this foreign till he has my secret, said Rob Roy. And then, twisting one button in one direction and another in another, pulling one stud upwards and pressing another downwards, the mouth of the purse opened. A small steel pistol was concealed within the purse, the trigger of which was connected with the mounting, so that the weapon would certainly be discharged and its contents lodged in the person of anyone who should tamper with the lock which secured his treasure. This, said he, touching the pistol, this is the keeper of my privy purse. And when I repeated this on Lauren Laverne, Radio 6, can you believe it got on there? <laughs> she couldn't quite believe it. <laughs> and got very, very excited about where the pistol might have gone. Anyway, do come and see the little exhibition before it ends. Um, I would really encourage you to do so. I'm just actually going to end with something which is a little bit cheeky, but has only come to my attention in the last week or so. But Walter Scott, a seal belonging to Walter Scott, is coming up at Lyman Tamil next Friday. Um, and unfortunately, it's got quite a big price tag on it, 
and it's far too quickly coming up for national museums to do anything about it. If we'd known in advance, we might have been able to do some fundraising. If anyone happens to be feeling super rich, do go and have a look. I'm going to see it tomorrow. I'm going to see something that Scott would have appreciated. It's not worth quite so much, um, but it uh, relates to, um, in fact, we come back to the coronation, because it relates to Archbishop Spottiswood, who anointed Charles I in his Scottish coronation with the gold ampulla that we have at National Museum of Scotland. And this is his seal. So that's what I'm going to see tomorrow morning. Um, yep, Scott and objects, objects and stories, human emotion, these things are all connected with our history here in Scotland and in Scott's past. I'd like, if I can, to raise another toast to Sir Walter Scott to thank him for what he has done for us in Scotland. Sir Walter Scott. Thank you.